All righty. Good to see everybody again tonight. And we're going to pick up where we left off uh, last Wednesday night. And we're talking about the whole, um, again, one of the reasons for this little mini series we're doing is because in the last several months, uh, I've had several people ask me uh, to do something along this line. And, um, uh, and especially because they heard about some other things we've done along this line in the past. So my my thoughts are a, a, a little scattered right here at the first, but we'll, we're going to we're going to get somewhere this evening. Um, <clears throat> you know this whole thing of uh, uh, children, and again, even even as I start, I, I'm careful about my terminology here because um, it it'll, it would be real easy for some of you just to check out and go, oh, I, I don't have little children, and yet at the same time. Um, uh, there's going to be some things that we're going to say that are applicable in a lot of ways in a lot of areas of anybody's life. Um, and we are going to talk about uh, some of the some of the stuff with with older children, too. Um, but again, I want to say this to all you teenagers out there. You know, the day is going to come uh, and you, you'll be amazed how rapidly it will come. That, um, you know, you'll be. Uh, married, having children, and um, and so if you can remember some of these things, we're going to try to keep it really simple. The theme of last Wednesday night was the word train, and and our text was Proverbs twenty two six, which says, "Train up a child in the way that he should go." Um, and I want to continue with that thought a little bit tonight. Um, you know, this is intended to be a spiritual work for a believer. Uh, for a believer, even natural things become spiritual. Um, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. And so suddenly what happens is, is even natural things, we do them from a whole different perspective. And we really do them because, uh, you know, we're going to look at the Lord someday. And, uh, you know, a lost man takes care of his health. A lost man takes care of his health. A lost man or woman, you know, they'll they'll uh, they'll exercise and they'll they'll eat healthy and all that. And you know why a lost person does it? Just because they want to feel good. Um, they want to compete in something. Um, you know, maybe even maybe even they want to fix a health problem. But for a believer, it takes on a whole new perspective. Um, you know, we we might want all those things, but why do we want those things? Um, the believer, everything about our life, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, it's all about something for the Lord. Um, uh, I remember hearing an old preacher uh, who at the time he made this remark, he was probably in his 70s. He was very unusual. Um, and, and, you know, I, I realize diseases come. And, and so, you know, I, I bear all that in mind. I, I realize you can take the best care of your health and still still have tons of issues. I bear that in mind. But the general rule is, the general rule is it's like your car. If you take care of it and you change the oil regularly and, you know, and, and you're, you know, it tends to last longer. It tends to run smoother. If you keep up with the maintenance schedule and you, you do the things that are geared to keep it working. It, it's just one of those laws of nature. And this old preacher got up one night. He was one of those guys. He was just amazing. He was amazing till he was 90 years old. And, um, he said, uh, some of you wonder why I still jog and why I do this and why I do that. And and, uh, and he said, it's because I want God to use me. And what he was trying to say was, he said, I want my usefulness to extend just as long as it can be. And he knew that there was an element of God would bless if he took care of his body. So his, his goal in his physical fitness was not to you know, outshine all the other 70 year olds or, you know, uh, no, no, it was, it was God word. It was God word. Um, so our, our, our goal in, um, uh, this whole thing, we said last week, it could be done from a purely practical standpoint, you know, 
the generation of our forefathers, <laughs> they um, sometimes it was a wee bit messed up, but a lot of them, man, they really understood this. Um, homes were much more disciplined. Obedience was demanded. And that was the generation of our forefathers. And a lot of them were lost. And you know why they did it? They did it from a purely practical perspective. God was not the picture. But for us, it's, it takes on a whole new dimension. For us, it is about the Lord. And it, it yes, we're going to reap the benefits of it, and and it, it's going to bless us in all sorts of ways. But but it, it goes beyond that. It goes be it, it goes into the realm of of us being rewarded before God. It goes into the realm of our children being useful for God, our children responding to God, our children someday thanking us. And and you see that Proverbs thirty one, her children arise up. And call her blessed. That, that may not happen, you know, in the first 10 to 15 years. But but God said, uh, God said that's that's part of it. When it comes to this whole theme of raising your children, um, some people are actively, actively seeking truth. And some do not. I'm talking about parents with young children in our churches. Some of them, man, they really want to know. And some of them, they really don't want to know. And the reason is they fear that the more they know, they are the more responsible. But that thinking is always faulty because God will hold us responsible for what we could have had. So you always have to remember that. I, I remember a number of years ago, our children were small. And uh, we were living in northern Ontario, and um, um, we had we had all our children except the one except the one that had passed away. Elizabeth would have been eleven, and so they were all sort of stair steps all the way down from there. And um, because of some of these principles, because God had brought that old preacher I told you about last week, I mentioned in passing, who had nine children. And it was a well-disciplined home. And he, he preached on that stuff all the time. So we were getting it with both barrels as young parents regularly. And he, he really beat this horse. Like I seldom ever mention it. But he beat it. I mean, he was on us young families. The church was full of young families, full of big families. And he rode this horse about every fourth message was going to have something about child rearing in it. And... Um, so there we were. We just landed in northern Ontario and a little small church in a mining community and uh, had about 50 or 60 people, which for a little mining community was amazing. And uh, this this one lady, she was from out east and she was a sweet lady. And they her and her husband, they had uh, two kids and they were they were real small, like, you know, maybe maybe one was two and a half and the other one was one. And um the mom was already having trouble controlling, you know, which is so common. You know, they call it the terrible twos. She was already, it was out of control. And yet she could look at, you know, um, our little ones and, and they were, you know, I mean, they still had their, their moments, but, but they were obedient. And she looked at my wife one day. Um, our kids would sit in church. There was no nursery there. Micah was born there. And, you know, I, we illustrated last week that thing of training a child to sit in church. And so we did that. And so here's Micah. He's less than a year old, and he's sitting quietly at the back on my wife's leg or on my leg. And, he, and, and you know, and she looked at this. She had no control whatsoever over her two children, none. So she goes to my wife privately, and she says, how did you do that? And so my wife begins to explain to her about how you get your kids to listen. And as soon as Mitzi began to get specific and the lady realized where this was going, I, I don't know what she thought. Did, did she think my wife had a book of subliminal, had a tape player with subliminal recordings that she played at night. I don't know what she thought, 
But when my wife began to tell her, this is what you need to do, she didn't even let Mitzi finish. She said, oh, no. She said, I'm not doing that. Need I say where her kids wound up? Some people are looking for truth and some people are not. Now, I am not looking to open up old wounds. We got some people watching. And, um, and you know, every time you get on this topic, invariably, invariably, every time you get on this topic, there'll be somebody out there that their kids are grown and gone. And a lot of times older folks, and they'll say, they'll say, uh, man, you know, um, I, I wish I'd, I wish I'd heard this when my kids were small, but those days are past for them. Um, so, you know, what the devil does is he's going to get on somebody's back today and you're going to, you're going to miss a lot. If you come for the next two or three Wednesday nights, if you let the devil get on your shoulder and, 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 and start beating you, you're, you're going to miss some stuff that you can still profit from because you can use it to help somebody else or whatever. In other words, we're not trying to open up old wounds and we are not trying to make people feel like failures. That's not what we're trying to do. Um, but you know what we're trying to do? We are trying to help people that, like we said last week, it's just, it's never talked about. It's never talked about. God will often give you what you want. He really will. Would you look at Psalm 106 for a minute? Psalm 106. I was going to go for two hours tonight, but that would put us at 10 o'clock. Ha uh ha. -huh. I know we started today at 8 o'clock, and I'm going to I'm going to try to shut down tonight about 8.30, 8.35. Can I say this? And I hope you uh, I hope you won't uh, grab at this and use it as a shield for a lot of truth over the next few Wednesday nights. But this is true. You ready? This is true. You're, you're in Psalm 106. We're going to read a verse in a minute. There are no perfect families. They do not exist. There are no perfect marriages. They do not exist. There are no perfect Christians. They do not exist. But there are some that are pressing toward the mark. And there are some that are following hard after God. And there are some that mean business. And you know what? They, they work hard at these things because they realize God will often give you what you want. You, 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 you watch how this life plays. You say, well, well, God didn't give me what I wanted. You know, I wanted a million dollars and three ranches and four Jaguars. And, and he sure didn't give me what I wanted. Well, yeah, I agree. yeah, I think we understand that. You know, and, and yet you're going to watch life play out. Many of you, many of you could already attest to this. You watch how people's life plays out. You know what they got? Oh, yeah, maybe they didn't get their million dollars. But they chased something and they got what they chased. They really did. Look at Psalm 106. Verse 11. And the waters covered their enemies. Talking about the children of Israel crossing the Red Sea. And the waters covered their enemies. There was not one of them left. Then believed they his words. They sang his praise. They soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly. Boy, they decided they, they were going to chase something. They lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. Remember that? They wanted those quail. Remember that? Verse 15. And God gave them their request, but sent leanness. 
into their soul. They got what they wanted, but they realized afterwards how unsatisfying it was. Look at Psalm 78. Psalm 78. And here's what I'm getting at. You know, a lot of people, they, they want something out of life. Um, and, and that's sort of different for everybody. And, you know, as Christians, you know, hopefully we're, the Lord's working on us and we're, we're, uh, we're, we're, uh, man, if you're saved, you really do have some spiritual desires. But you know what a lot of parents do? They chase something. And they get their they get their eyes on something while their kids are growing. And you know what happens? They chase that thing. They want something. And that something, whatever it is, is more important than them training their kids. So all of a sudden, one day they wake up. And Johnny's 20 now. And they realize they were chasing that other stuff. And they were paying a lot more attention to other things. And you know what? They got what they wanted. But because their children were not priority, they missed that. And they realize it late. So I want to challenge you this morning, this morning, this evening. I, mean, I want to challenge you this evening. Those of you that have children or those of you that are going to have children. The world has a thousand things that dangles out in front of you. And many of them are good. You know, not they're not all bad. You know, there are some things that are good. But um, you know what? God's given you those children. They need to be your priority. Look at Psalm 78. The Lord mentions this again, verse 27. He rained flesh also upon them as dust and feathered fowls like as the sand of the sea. And he let it fall in the midst of the camp round about their habitations. So they did eat and were well filled. For he gave them. He gave them what they wanted. You know, they, some people have desired above all things. What is it? God looks down at your heart and mind. And we have a thousand desires. And it's, it's not wrong. It's not wrong to desire financial security. It's not wrong to desire, boy, I'd, I'd really, I'd really like to have a, you know, set of new curtains. I, I, I'd, I'd really like to have a new shotgun. You know, I'd really like to, have, you know, that, that's not wrong. That's not wrong. But what is it that you desire above all things? What is it that if God said, "Oh, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you the top two or three things that you want the most," what would it be? What would it be? What would it really be? I mean, in this context tonight, you'd give the right answer. Yeah, but what if God looked at your heart and he didn't verbally ask it? He said, Gabriel, look at that. Look at their heart. You see, there it is. One, two, three. That's what they really want. All right, Gabriel, let's give it to them. Would it, would it, would it be a home blessed by God? Would it be? Is that real high on your list? Some have desired above all things the home blessed of God, and God has granted that desire. So I want you to take what you can over these next few Wednesday nights, and I'm not going to drag this series out forever. I'm going to try to hit some highlights, but I want you to take what you can and use it and at least consider what you hear. At least consider it. Um, look at Psalm 127. Psalm 127. Again, I want you to feel free to, uh, after service, you know, if I say something, you've got a question, please feel free to ask. Psalm 127, of course, you guys recognize this, this chapter, this verse, we quoted it last week. Psalm 127, verse 1, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. But go down to verse 3. It says, lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. 
As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. Um, you know, you know, God intended that children would be a blessing. So you got to get hold of that. So I, I, I just want to throw this out there, okay? And I, all I'm doing, I'm just trying to get you to think, okay? I, I just, I just want you to think with me. Um, God intended that your children would be a blessing, a joy, like, like legitimately, like really, like where, where you, nobody would have to prompt you to answer yes to that question. Where you'd go, wow, you know, I, I really enjoy my kids. God intended. That was God's intent. You know, we, we have six children. They were approximately 18 months apart. And um, in those early years, people would see us in a store. They would see Mitzi in the store. And, of course, some of them would make really rude remarks, you know. She'd be standing at the, the till, and there'd be Elizabeth and Mary and Levi, and, and uh, here's Charity and the cooker. And uh, and one of them would say, do you know what's causing that? You know, it was like it was out of control, and Mitzi was being beat down by her crazy husband. And I, I won't tell you some of the other comments, not mixed company. People are pretty free with their dumb comments. But we would have, you know, people would see Mitzi in the store with all the kiddos. And, uh, or they would see her with three and one in her belly. And they would say, uh, how many children do you have? And Mitzi would answer in invariably. Another young mom would say this. Oh, you have, you have five, you have six, you have seven. We had seven at one point. They would say this. Well, I just have one. And they drive me crazy. And you would see them push their screaming brat through the mall or the store. You ever seen it? <laughs> you know, here's the here's the, the stroller, you know, they, they probably, you know, but some of them rented one at the mall or they brought it from the car. And they're they're walking through this through the mall, just acting like everything's calm. It's cucumber, and, and there's Johnny or Sally, and she's going, ah! Ah! And, and they're just they're just pushing the stroller through the store, you know, it's like everything's kosher. And the and the kid in the stroller, or the one, or the, there'd be one in the stroller, and she'd be trying to hold the other one over here, or or the dad would try to be hold. And they're, they're whining and crying and demanding and, and pushing mom and dad to the end of their sanity. This is the reason, this is the reason why some young couples decide not to have children. They see that, they don't, they don't want any kids. Would you look at Isaiah 3? Isaiah 3. Song of Solomon. And you'll see Isaiah. Isaiah 3, verse 1. Isaiah 3, verse 1. Isaiah 3, verse 1. Here we go. For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. You know what he just said there? He said, I'm sending famine. Okay, this whole chapter, or a lot of it, is about uh, the Lord was announcing to Israel an impending judgment that was right around the corner. Okay, verse 2. The mighty man and the man of war, the judge, the prophet, and the prudent and the ancient. The captain of 50 and the honorable man and the counselor and the cunning artificer and the eloquent orator. Now watch. Part of judgment. And I will give children to be their princes and babes shall rule over them. And the people shall be oppressed, everyone by another and everyone by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient and the base against the honorable. 
Look at verse 8. For Jerusalem is ruined and Judah is fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. The show of their countenance doth witness against them. And they declare their sin is Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. Now watch. As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. One of the marks of judgment was children would be their oppressors. Children, their children would make their life miserable. You know what that is? That's not at all what God ever intended not at all but it has become the norm and it has become the norm in our churches it's become the norm so i want to look at some verses real quick look at proverbs we're going to zip through a few verses and then we're going to we're going to close it up for tonight proverbs 13 verses that you know verses that you've seen All right, Proverbs 13, verse 24. He that spareth his rod hateth his son. He, it, it doesn't say he that spareth his son really loves his, his child, but, you know, you know he, he has issues with all this because of the way he was raised or the way she was raised. You know, you'll notice, and one thing you got to love about the Bible the Lord absolutely just doesn't make excuses for anybody. You know where that comes from? That comes from us. You do realize you're going to stand in front of the God who will not accept one excuse. Not one. You, you, you know, you got your reasons. But he understands whether you could have fulfilled his commandment or not. And he'll deal with you accordingly. And by the way, he'll deal with you in this life accordingly. Proverbs 13, 24. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Betimes, that word betimes means early. Early. Okay. Look at Proverbs 19. Proverbs 19. Now, you know, you got to guard against something as we're going through this. You got to guard against all of a sudden your mind instantly kicks up a reaction. Instantly, you got all your reasons why. Well, you know, and but this, but well, but I think, but but what is that? Do yourself a favor just for a few minutes and just let the scripture stand. Just just go, what if this really means what it says? Why don't you do that? Proverbs 19, verse 18. Chasten thy son while there is hope. There comes a day when it's just, you can't do it anymore. That day is past. He said, but there is a day when you can still change their whole world. Chasten thy son while there is hope. And let not... Thy soul spare for his crying. We're going to comment more on that probably next week. Look at chapter 22. Chapter 22. Verse 15. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. It, look, look, every kid's just chuck full of nonsense. 
and they're chock full of, I mean, you know, we are, we are the fallen sons of Adam. Now, you know, you've got some children that are just rangy as all get out. And you got others that are just very quiet, but, but, you know, their, their issues are different. Some, some are quietly evil and quietly, some are just more naturally submissive and, 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 and some, some are not, you know, um, but you know what the Bible says about, about every kid's heart? Look at it. Verse 15. Foolishness is bound. It doesn't say it's there. It's like it's wrapped up tight in the heart of a child. Okay? But the rest of the verse. But there is one thing that fixes it. But the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Chapter 23. Real quick. Chapter 23, verse 13. You know, this is the wisest man that ever lived. The, the man that God endued with wisdom because he asked. And God praised him because he asked for this. And he's the one that's telling us this. And of course, this is by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. 23 verse 13. Withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Verse 14. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Look at verse 20, chapter 29, chapter 29, verse 15. Chapter 29, verse 15. The rod and reproof, the rod and reproof give wisdom. But a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Look at verse 17. This, this, this verse, it rings with sweetness. Ready? Correct thy son, and he shall give thee what? You know what every parent wants? Nobody wants a child or a bunch of children that are a constant source of unrest. And the God that created this world said, do you, do you, do you think he knows a little bit about how this works? Do you think maybe? Do you think maybe just maybe he knows what's going on? He said, correct thy son that he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. So I'm going to, I'm going to give you one illustration and, and we're going to stop. And then we're going to, we're going to, we're going to go further with this next week. Um, a man that I know was uh, driving down the road one day and um, uh, again, I'm, I'm, you know, true story. And uh, he, they, he lived out in the country with his kiddos and, um, and his wife. And they're driving this ramshackle pickup truck, you know. I mean, true redneck. And I mean, he's riding down this this gravel road, you know, bouncing down the road with his redneck children. And they're <laughs> they're bouncing down the road. And uh, I, I kid you not, this guy was a full blown redneck. But he loved the Lord. Good guy. Good guy. I tell you what, there's some rednecks. They're mighty smart. They're a lot smarter than the educated, refined folks. Love the Lord. Love the Lord. He's got a he's got two or three of his kids in the in the truck with him. And you know, must must have been an older truck and had a full bench seat. So he's got two or three of his kiddos with him. And they're driving. And he's got a a, a, a fuel tank in, in his bed of his truck, and it's full of gasoline. And something caught his eye in the rear view mirror, and he thought he saw sparks you know just like this guy we prayed for tonight those fuel trunks trucks never blow up two weeks ago i was riding behind one of these what do they call it when you have two two trailers yeah two uh, but it fuel tanks uh, and I, I i i was thinking i was driving thinking wow isn't that wild you never hear of any of those things exploding and that must be because they're loaded with safety features. You know, gasoline, and never an accident. And then we hear about this guy this week, and, uh, and his, his truck exploded. This guy's driving his truck, and he thought he saw sparks. And he says to his kid, just a knee-jerk reaction. I mean, suddenly he realizes this could end immediately. And he says to his kids, 
jump, jump. And he said, uh, they didn't even bother to open the window. He said, the window was already down. And he said, choo, choo, choo. clear out that window. Now, he wasn't going 100 kilometers an hour. You know, you know, he was, you know, but, but my point is this, and, and he, he commented on this. He said, do you know why my kids did that? I know what would happen in a lot of vehicles. Jump, Johnny, jump. But mommy, why? <laughs> like out the window, you know, and, and boom. Yeah. Everybody dies because Johnny and Sally. Do you want know the purpose? Do you know? Do you know where you want your children? You want them to where when you say, do this now, where they just instinctively, yes. And they do it instinctively. That is the purpose of training. He said, I had trained those children. He said, I worked with them. He said, we would be out in the farm or we would be doing things. And he said, randomly, I would yell out a command. And he said, I absolutely demanded immediate response. And he worked to promote that response as part of training. And, um, and there were ways that he did that. And you know what he did? He was bent. He was bent on having obedient children. And he said, boy, there was a day when it was emergency and life or death. And he said, when I said jump, he said, they didn't argue. They didn't hesitate. They didn't look at me funny. They just instantly obeyed. And that's what we're after here. If they learn that in your house, It gives you rest in your house. Can you imagine how unstressful it is when Johnny and Sally don't whine? And when you look at them and say, um, can you go do this? And they don't give you excuses and they don't delay and they don't have to do it. And they don't get in a fight on the way with, you know, Sally and Sherry and, and they don't get sidetracked, you know, with the frogs and the, and the, they absolutely immediately do what you say. It would get slack at our house once in a while. You know why? Because we're fallen sons of Adam. And I would notice, wow, it's starting to get slack around here. So you know what we do? We're talking about training. We would make a game out of it. We really would. You know, it doesn't all have to be dark and harsh. And so I'd say, all right, kids. I'd gather them all together. I'd say, look, when I call you guys, I'm getting this massive delay going on. You know, and I have to repeat myself. So, so here's what we're going to do. Okay. You go to the far end of the house. And we lived in a big house. And you go to that end of the house. And you, and, but they're all grinning because they know what's, what's up. And you go to that end of the house. And you go to that. And I'm going to say, kids. And I said, I want to hear, yes, sir, coming. And I want to hear, zoom. I want to hear, boom, 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 boom. I want to hear those feet. Instead of, you know, Mary. Mary's sitting here. Mary. Mary. Come on, Dad. You know, you know what I did? I'd, I'd say, no, 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 no. Let's try that again. Send him back to the four corners of the house. All right, guys. Everybody, come. Practice, practice, practice. And it was fun. It, we, they'd laugh. They'd joke. We, uh, you know, we, we'd have fun with it. But we, you know what that is? That's training. That's training. It's practice. They, it's got to become instinctive. And sometimes it doesn't take that long. I said one illustration, and I've given two. So since I'm already made myself a liar, I'll give you one more. <laughs> Some of you in your mind, you think this is going to take forever. You know, and you, you just dread and see the devil does that. The devil paints this terrible scenario in front of you. Is it going to take work? It is. Is it going to take a while? Yeah, probably. You know, Rome wasn't built in a day. Nothing good usually happens quick. It's a lot of work. But it doesn't take near as long as you think. And some things will actually happen very quickly. One day, I, I went to public school until I was in uh, 
I didn't switch to a Christian school till I was in 10th grade. So I was in public school. And one evening, um, I don't know, I was in fourth, fifth grade. And I came home and I was supposed to write a report. Now, I always dreaded it when dad was going to be home when I had homework. Dad worked a lot of night shifts. And, uh, and I dreaded it because I, I knew what was going to happen. This scenario was going to play itself out. I would be playing and dad would say, did you finish your homework? I'd say, yeah. He'd say, can I see it? I'm like, no, 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 no. Can I see it? So I brought my report to dad. My dad looked at it. He said, you know, the handwriting on this is so sloppy. He said, if I were your teacher, I'd give you an F. And this is two or three pages. And I hated writing. I hated writing. I, I, I didn't mind school, but I hated writing. Can you imagine? It really doesn't go together. And dad said, uh, write it again. Well, there was only one right response. Because my dad had trained me. There was no other response except, yes, sir. See, I, I made it. He, he, my dad made it really peaceful around the house. Yeah, I, I wasn't at peace inside, but it was really peaceful at the house. <laughs> and so I wrote the report again. He said, let me see it. He said, man, this thing still looks terrible. Now, he wasn't being an idiot. And he wasn't being, you know, he wasn't just trying to waive his authority. Because my dad already had that. He didn't need to prove anything. That was well established in our home. He goes, son, this, this still looks pathetic. He said, write it again. Yes, sir. So 35 minutes or 40 minutes go by and I've written it again. He goes, let's take a look at it. He said, this still looks terrible. He said, you can do better than this. Oh, boy, I heard those words more than once. He said, write it again. The fourth time it passed inspection, that proved two or three things. It proved I could have done it right the first time. And can I tell you, oh, my soul, did that cure me of writing sloppy reports? Did it ever motivate me to make sure that from that point on, they always looked good? I was at a bank in Prince Albert 15 years ago, 16 years ago, and I got to sign something. She goes, and I write sloppy sometimes when I'm in a hurry. But, you know, I, I did my John Hancock on there. And she goes, wow, I like your handwriting. And I go, there's a big story behind that one. <laughs> you know what that was? Training. You know what he did? It was going to be miserable for me until I did it right. Boy, I learned that lesson quick. I learned that lesson quick. I'm just telling you. You can train your children to obey, to obey immediately, to do the job right. And it will bless your soul. And the day will come when they will say, they'll look them right in the eye. I'm telling you what, man, my dad died um, November 23rd, 1978, Thanksgiving morning. I saw him collapse at the table and all that stuff. And uh, the, 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 until the day he died, I was 15. I never went through that stage where I was embarrassed of my dad. Never did. My dad was my hero. You say, uh, yeah, he was that strict? Oh, yeah. See, that's your problem. You think, oh, if I do it this other way, they won't love me. No, you got it backwards. You got it backwards. And I'll see my dad again someday. And I will thank him. And I will hug his neck. Her children arise up and call her blessed. This is a whole lot more important than you realize. We're going to stop there. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Bless this truth. Let it sink down deep, Lord, this thing of training. God, the day will come that they'll, they'll forget a lot of these details. Some of these young people, Lord, they'll forget these details. But, Lord, may they remember, God, that they, if they'll invest themselves in this, and if they will fall on their knees and seek you, if they will make this one of the desires of their heart, God, that you will honor this. God, that we can raise up a generation of children that will obey their parents and, Lord, obey thee. 
Lord, help us, we pray in Jesus' name. I want to give you just a minute to pray, and we're going to be dismissed. Lord, bless your people tonight. God, we're still dwelling on this, this part about these young children. And Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, God, that you, you would, Lord, these people that are watching out in the distance, their kids are grown. And, and Lord, we, we've got people in our midst that are going to see this and hear this. Lord, in Jesus' name, I pray you would bless them. I pray, Lord, that they would take what they're going to hear and they would help somebody else. And Lord, that the spiritual truths that are going to come out of this, Lord, like even that thing of just doing everything for your glory. Lord, that's a simple truth. But God, it, it applies to all of us, whether we're raising children or not. God, help us, Lord, that we will take these truths. And by your spirit, Lord, we pray you'd quicken us in Jesus name. Amen. You're dismissed.